I got stuff for you. Holy moly. I need to get some snakes and release them around my house. Uh, but I love eating people. I love eating kids. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. corn, corn. Every day that you open your mouth, I know, right? I'm more convinced that you're abducted by aliens. <laughs> no. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the, the... These are idiots. I was laughing reading this because I already knew how you would feel. Idiot. What part <laughs> of the story fits your balloon? Well, this isn't a yeah. UFO. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Well, Mothman. Oh, yeah, Mothman. Well, everyone, I think we know exactly what it is. So say it all with me. It was the Sandhill Crane. Would you try it? No. You wouldn't eat it? No. Why? Because they're probably toxic. There'd be a lot of poop in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Seen a six foot alligator go swinging through the air and slam into a tree. Welcome back. Decryptids of the Corn podcast. I am the great and powerful mystery, and this poor laptop is, I could smell it cooking, trying to do all this stuff. Uh, no J tonight, everybody, but don't worry. I have an amazing, an amazing guest. He's here promoting his podcast and his conference and all kinds of other goodies we're going to get into tonight. So please welcome Brandon. And Brandon, please go through all your stuff and give your shout outs. Jay normally does that, so I'm going to let you do it. Miss Reedy, thank you so much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Audience, you know you have the coolest hosts in the world, so just throw them a shout-out, throw them a like, throw them a share. It means more than we know. It may, you may take it for granted, but it means more than you know. So thank you, dude, so much for having me, brother. This is awesome. Uh, you guys run an amazing thing over here, and it's so aligned. This is perfect. So to that, then, I am Brandon Thomas. I host a show called Expanding Reality. We've been doing it just over three years now. Uh We've got all sorts of bonus content, stuff like that. We do the Hangouts over on Patreon, and uh, we've been having a blast with it, man. So much so, and talking to so many authors, as I'm sure you do, that we've actually founded our own publishing house uh, called Redigital Publishing. That is a word. I figured all words you know, were made up, so I just try my hand at it and make one up. Redigital means uh, ridiculously original, and that's, that's our mantra, man. Um, so we, uh, I created a, it's seven in the series right now, and it's a community project, super cool, now, I uh, hand-drew these things, so it's a hand-drawn kind of a deal. There's some that are deliberate that walk you through things. Others are just really cool, lined, or artist-inspired sketchbooks, and they have artist renditions in front. So we're doing a lot of cool stuff with the publishing. Very excited about that. As well, now, the events. And, um, you know, we could share screen and show some stuff at the event here a little bit later, not in the intro, but just wanted to introduce our event here. We have a Befriending Bigfoot event, May 15th through the 20th, in beautiful Blairsville, Georgia. We have this 26-acre ranch out there, which, again, I'll show you pictures of and stuff. Uh, in the meantime, though, you can check it on the website, expandingrealitypodcast.com. And over there, you'll find not only the show, the publishing, but also the events. And it'll have all the info. We're booking now. Super pumped about this thing, dude. It's going to be insane. And, again, we'll go over sort of the plan itinerary, some of the presenters. I know that we have some mutual uh, friends in this thing. So can't wait to tell you all, all about it, brother. And, again, thank you so much for having me, man. Uh, pleasure's all mine. And for everybody at home. I do have to apologize. I am recording on the, the travel set for the podcast, so if the audio is not the quality it normally is, we the, we had to bust out the old Zoom PK4 again. So she's been in hibernation for over a year, but she's cooking. But no, no, thank you for coming. And I know this was very uh, last second because I hooked up with you right as we were getting into the, the hospital, and then obviously it's been weeks and stuff like that. And then t I finally got the studio set up in, in here. We're at Ronald McDonald House, all the listeners know. Uh, so I set up the studio. I'm like, I text you today. I'm like, hey, you, you're you free this week? And you're like, yeah. I'm like, well, what about tonight? And you're like, yep, let's go. So, yeah, thank you. So, yep, well, I'm here to take the ride with you. So which thing do you want to get into first? I'm here and honored. 
God, dude. So nature, reality, um, how you perceive reality. Are we talking uh, the freaky woo-woo phenomena? I love Bigfoot. There's so many fascinating things that we can go into with that and how it's connected to so many other cool as shit things that we can talk about. So really, it's open to you, the host. Where would you like to start, man? Hey, I'm just here for the ride. I do got to say something, though. Uh, for all the people that are commenting, we don't do many lives anymore, so we're trying to get back into doing some of the lives. I'll read most of the questions here at the end uh, for Brandon, but you don't know this. There's a big, in our, in our Patreon Discord, there's a fight, a civil war for the Brandons. We have so many Brandons that they're, they're all fighting in there. There's a Centaur, Brandon, and all this stuff. So I just had to put some of these on screen. Another Brandon. I love it. And I, yes, I had, I, I love it. We're, I was born in the era of where we were just naming kids the same thing. And it's amazing. <laughs> Would, so we appreciate y'all hanging out with us, though. That's bad, badass, yeah. <laughs> Do you know Brandon Joe Williams? I'll, I'll get you with a... I've got a few more Brandons, actually. There's a guy digging up boats in Utah, proving that it, it like, resets the shape, uh, age of the earth and all this kind of shit. So I'll connect you with him. That's another Brandon. I've got a list of Brandons I will connect you with, <laughs> man. We good. just kind of roll in packs. Represent. There you go. You can just have a whole month of Brandons. That'd be great. There we go. Brand Timbers. Brand, yeah. Brand Timber. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, let's I guess let's just talk about your your podcast first and kind of how'd you get it going and all that stuff. Yeah, man. I started uh, like I said about three and a half years ago now just before that, about man, twenty nineteen, uh my wife and I were driving in her car to the store and she was listening to three dudes talking on her audio there and I was like, What the hell is this? And it's twenty nineteen, right? So I'm a little behind the times. She was like, This is a podcast and I was like, What the fuck is a podcast? So Ended up um, doing, I was just hooked on this show, uh, last podcast on the left. We ended up seeing them live and all this stuff. Really cool. Uh, and then it was like, well, I can do this. And so we bought mics and stuff and started doing our own show. We had about 50 something, 52 episodes probably of a show called The Up and Adam, A-D-A-M Experiment. Uh, all of it stripped. I had a, uh, I did some fun music things like about 5G and uh, the um, pharmaceutical industry is called Big Pharma. And of course, you know where that goes and. <laughs> So we had some fun stuff with that. Um, and again, it's all scrubbed. Yeah, my hook was DJ Front Butt. So you'll see him come out every now and then with some fun music. Um, but hey, we, um, yeah, we got into some really cool stuff. And it was more of an esoteric conversation to where my wife and I really don't uh, have a delineation as far as um, spiritual beliefs or religious practices or anything like that. We're just really open and searching, I guess, is what you could say. So another friend of ours was uh, an atheist. We had a Christian in the nuts. And so we blended this thing together. It was fun. 2020 hit. Everybody bailed. And I was ready to change this thing up anyhow. I had a green notebook that had a list of hundreds of people that I listened to on Coast to Coast AM. And, you know, over 20 years, man, that I've just been absorbed in the phenomena and been a psycho nut for a very long time. So I'm very familiar with that realm. And so um, I've always just been fascinated by this stuff. Uh, whenever everybody switched over, I was ready to change name. I was ready to do all this, start going through that list of folks, and nobody wanted to come back. So I was like, cool, start, start on Expanding Reality, launched, and we've been running ever since, man. And we go everywhere. I've had, I mean, incredible, like the the amount of folks, and you know how this goes, man. You think that, oh, if I could just get that guest on too, dude, you can get anybody on you want. You know, it's, mm -hmm. um, read a book uh, when I was 18 called Conversations with God by a guy named Neil Donald Walsh. Have you ever heard of that or no, are you into that stuff? That's this go ahead sorry oh no you broke up but what were you gonna say no i just said that that's jay's side of the show got you yeah fair enough uh so this dude like changed my life in the direction of uh, i was in at that time and then you know 20 years later i have a show and 25 episodes in he's sitting down with me on a call like this and i'm sitting here talking to this dude right uh and then you go anywhere from there to you know tommy chong you've had all, all kinds of crazy cool folks on the show, right? And so you have a blast, but the, the whole point of the thing and why I named it the way that I did was it's, it's ever going, it's expanding, right? I want, the verb was very important. And um, we're growing in so many different directions. And so it made sense that I'm not into just one thing. It's everywhere. It's from comics to spirituality to dogman to uh, quantum physics. We've had some incredibly cool people on uh, Dr. Doug Matsky wrote a book called Deep Reality. Only got to co-write a book with uh, Dr. Uh, William A. Tiller, and he's just a good buddy of mine. We hang out all the time. This, and you start to combine those concepts with what we've been hearing in niche things. Like when you really dig down into the contact phenomena, for instance, and you really start looking into this and how it's changed and the subjectivity of it. And then you 
get a guest on like Dr. Michael P. Masters, who blows your mind about thinking that, you know, maybe there are future humans coming back in time machines and stuff like that. And so you really get to expand your, you know, really what it is, is it's about critical thinking, even the flat earth conversations, all that stuff, man. It's about expanding your ability to critically think. And in this whole process, uh, I've sort of noticed early on that beliefs are a big challenge in this realm's uh, ability to change is what I will say fluidly. And um, there was a movie in 99 that I watched by a guy named Kevin Smith, and it's called Dogma. Have you ever seen the movie Dogma? Mm-mm. You would love it. Put it on your list. It's amazing. Uh, so it's a comedy. It's in the uh, vein of Jay and Silent Bob right there in it. Uh, that's that whole thing. And George Carlin's in it, all that stuff. But anyway, in the movie, uh, there's a character called Rufus. It's played by Chris Rock. And he has a line that re- he goes, uh, I don't have beliefs. I have ideas because ideas are easier to change. And man, I grabbed that. My little 18-year-old me and was like, uh-huh, I'm going to hang on to that and put it in my pocket because it sounds useful. And then all I saw around me were all these people limiting themselves by their beliefs. And they would say, no, 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 I can't, uh, especially the self-imposed ones. No, no, I can't because I'm not blank. Or no, I can't because I don't whatever. Right? All these little Newtonian things. And I just found it fascinating. So floating through this realm, sans beliefs, uh, and really I've just come to one, honestly. It's temporary truths. That's what we're riddled with is this idea of, what you know now and hang on to like an island you're pole vaulting between uh, is just temporarily true for you right now. And with new information, let's say maybe you find it in this life, maybe it's death that is that new information, you'll, you'll feel differently about stuff, right? So I think leaving that open and my ability to sort of be fluid and not saying I'm right about this because I have an emotional investment in it being correct, right? So with this, the show has just been awesome because I don't have a... Uh, hill to die on per se like I, I'm not telling anybody what their story is I'm not here to say no you didn't and prove myself right like so this is just a really open honest exchange of really cool ideas and I think that's what it's all about it's just hey you know maybe we're all and the metaphor is is that we're all mapping consciousness from our own perspective in like a cave let's say and we have a flashlight and all we can say is, is we can see what we can see with our flashlight but we hear from the other side of a cave uh, maybe in a zoom call You know, uh, way over there that somebody saw a Bigfoot and it made them feel like this and it felt like that. Now, a lot of people nowhere near that person will go, bullshit, you know, you're dumb. Bigfoots aren't real, whatever, just because they're not in their part of the cave or they can't see it. Maybe there's one right in front of them, but their flashlight can't see it. So in this way, everybody's got this fascinating role to play in this incredible environment where we find all these mysteries that we're drawn to and connected by. And I think it's beautiful, man. So the show has done an incredible job of expanding my reality, which has been sort of the whole point, you know? I think I'd still do it if uh, nobody listened. You know, it's one of those things. No, yeah, I I think we're in a similar boat with... There's stuff since starting the show that I've completely 180'd on, I'm sure, and we talk about that on the show all the time, that you're supposed to upgrade with, you know, new information. Uh, Connor, he's put something in here. I'll click it. I don't do this very often. All scientists, people should be able to change their outlooks based off of new experiments and evidence right on. Yep. And that's, you know, uh, even science. Honor, shout out. And, like, uh, I'm a Christian, but I still have all of these big beliefs. Like, with the stuff we're doing, I've seen a Bigfoot. I've dealt with the paranormal and all of it. And it's, I, I think some Christians do limit themselves. Specifically, I'm just talking from my experience with Christianity, off of some of the weirder parts of reality when, you know, the Bible's a very supernatural book. You know, all kinds of stuff happen, but I don't know. It is, it is. it's just really, it's, grown, like, stuff I believe now, I probably wouldn't have believed in three years ago before starting talking to people like you. You know, you start talking and you gain more experiences that other people have had. It is amazing. Well, it's what you have and your interpretation of their experiences. And this is what's so beautiful about it, man. It's just how you feel about the things going on around you. And that's what's so interesting about sort of the world we live in as well. Because I know you guys talk about freedom and you're very big into not being told what to do as I am. I'm a Texan native. We live out here, born and raised. We have 12 acres and we can shoot anything we want off of any direction of our house. And we feel great. We like that sort of freedom, right? Not going to harm anyone with it. We never do that. But the whole point is, is that this is an enlightening process. And when you get into that enlightening process, you go through it in phases, man. And, you know, and, I mean, there's an endless amount of phases, again, temporary truths. And as long as, again, you're able to kind of navigate it uh, fluidly, then it's awesome. Now, having an anchor, sort of having a pulse that'll guide you through that, a, 
a heartbeat, a North Star, if you will, is wonderful, man. I mean, as long as it doesn't limit you, right? And by limits, it doesn't mean like, oh, I'd really like to have that extra donut, but Satan doesn't want, you know, that's Satan talking, not me, right? So where where's the truth in that? You know what I mean? Or, oh, I want to do something, uh, but I'm not worthy enough, you know? So there's, there's some elements of uh, govern me harder daddy that can come with a religious ideology in the sense that it takes a lot of your authenticity and puts it into a frame of reference, which is fine, man. It's because again, it's navigable, right? It's not as, um, I guess, jarring in a way. But again, uh, so I'll save all the scripture talk that I have that lists out that maybe the God in the Bible is the devil. We'll do that another time. We'll we'll do it another time, buddy. Because I'm not here to squash anybody's anything. But what I do find fascinating is this place, man. And it does seem to just be this fascinating realm of just dangling keys out here, and how you feel about it, and how other people get your attention is really, again, what kind of curates your reality. And so, again, it's fascinating when you turn news off and you start listening to things like this. All these people here in the chat, these amazing folks, it, are, are just incredible. And they could be watching Fox or something right now, being scared or hyping up that something crazy is going to happen in the markets or something like that. But they're not. They're here with us and they're hanging out. And that's a choice. And it's beautiful. And uh, th this is the new way forward here. And this sort of congregation, what we're doing with the event, and because the event we're doing is like no other, and we'll come back to it, but it's a very intimate conference is what it is. It's not uh, something to where it's, um, you're detached at all. You're, you're amongst it. You know, we're hanging out. It's amazing. So it's just a beautiful place out here, and your interpretation of reality is what I find so fascinating. And there's so many things when we get into topics like consensus reality, subjectivity, um, RAS, your reticular activating system, and how that affects literally your, what you physically see in your reality. Uh, it's it's fascinating, man. This whole place is is amazing. Oh, definitely. Sorry, I was reading. I that's why I don't normally do it with the comments. Yeah, everybody in the chat's them. banging, man. No, that's okay. We can we can stop. Uh, you know, we're not. Uh, this is a co collective creative here, guys. So thank you all for the energy. Uh, everybody's awesome. The Brandon's Reaper awesome. shout out. Fighter. Otterly. It's it's Tiger Lily. I did Ottinger this. Jilly Lily. What I, is it? It's oh oh Tiger Lily. <laughs> it's just Tiger Lily. I read it. How you read shit? Sometimes? Literally two nights ago. Like, we ooh, had a that was live way off. And I read it the same way. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sherwin and uh, Sherwin Asani, Jackson. I don't, I'm not just wonderful at reading names, but I've hey, never, guys, thank you all so much. This is incredible. I've never got Sherwin's last name right. We've known Sherwin for Branded years. Prime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the conference sounds amazing. I was just playing on the website a little bit, and everybody at home, all the links will be in the description below when this comes out on the podcast platform. Uh, but yeah, what? Why don't we talk about that? And I, I have notes to come back to later for some of the longer discussions, but I want to get all the promotions yeah. out first before I forget it. Yeah, let's hoard this thing out for a second, if you guys don't mind. That'd be fun, right? Uh, first of all, um, again, I want to thank you. But uh, we have, like, merch that comes along with this. We have the ERE, which is the Expanding Reality Excursions. This logo, very cool. It's a patch uh, that we're going to have out there, as well as we have an event-specific logo, and this thing glows in the dark, which is cool as shit. And then, of course, a matching pin, uh, that we'll, we'll have for the events as well. Some other things too. Just wanted to kind of throw that out. Already been ordered and here, and we're excited about it. Okay, so I am going to share my screen here. Okay. Boom. Okay, if you guys want to um, head on over. Or, ooh, I, I do this because I do a show. Audio only audience, head on over to the <laughs> description uh, down there where you can find the link to the video version of this. We're going to now be shown a little something that you'll enjoy a little bit more with your eyes. Okay, so we have this here on expanding... Uh, uh, realitypodcast.com. Now from here, guys, you can see again that we have the three elements here, but we'll just skip on over to the events. And on that, you can see this is our excursions page. We do have several more of these planned uh, in the near future. We have uh, Superstition Mountains in Arizona, Mount Adams, of course, uh, right near Rainier where Kenneth Arnold saw his sighting. Bunch of crazy shit going on out there. Mount Shasta in California. And yes, the Giza Plateau. We have a buddy. Dude, I'll totally connect you with this guy, Larry Paul. Uh, he's the president of the American Pyramid Association. And he'll come on do presentations about like the uh, tomb of the birds and shit. The guy's fascinating. Anyway, so we're going to be doing some cool stuff out there with him as well. So this is definitely a global project here. Uh, we'll come back to the farm here in a minute. Uh, it's badass. And I will show you the plan itinerary. So when we get out there, guys, uh, we have Trey Hudson kicking this thing off. He is a uh, author researcher of the Meadow Project. Absolutely fascinating dude. Uh, the next presenter that we have is going to be... 
Sheila and Scott Granger, and they are local Bigfoot experts. You can find them at Squatch Fishing Outfitters on Facebook, and they are fascinating. Now, they are, again, local a local hookup out there in the northern Georgia mountains out there. Um, and that night as well, we are going to also, Trey Hudson is bringing all of his night vision and thermal imaging stuff for a Bigfoot adventure hike, and you'll see why on the pictures in a minute are place actually butts up to the Chattahoochee National Forest. So we have thousands of acres rather than, you know, that's our backyard for the whole time we're there and we get full access to it. So the next day though, guys, after Sheila and Scott tell us about a spot called Booger Alley, then we are going to go to said Booger Alley the next day. And we're going to spend all day out there. Uh, we then have, um, so mostly what this is broken down into is hikes and nature and outdoor during the day. And then in the evenings, we're just going to do a two hour presentation block and then still more things in the evening. Um, like I was a touring musician for 12 years. I'm going to bring my guitar. We have other musicians, a lot of musicians uh, attracted to the phenomena, by the way, which is a fascinating thing. I'm sure you've discovered doing this show. All about but we have these um, hiking days and everything, and we're going to be spending time. Dude, it is in frequency. We do a show called Frequency Theorists. I'll invite you next time. We can do them. Man, they're fun. Okay, um, so we uh, are only going to do these two-hour blocks uh, each evening, but they're going to be banger, guys. And we're going to do our damnedest to stream these. So if you can't make it, you can catch these, but during the day is where this is at. Now, keep in mind, we've got Trey Hudson, um, Owen Hunt, the next night, who is a comedian. He is going to be going on, uh, doing a comedy bit. He's got somebody else he's bringing with him. He's fucking hilarious. So if you guys want to check out Owen Hunt, uh, and I'd recommend as I'm going through this, kind of Googling these folks or going through the uh, planned itinerary on the website, you can kind of Google these folks or, or just they all have Instagrams and shit. But um, Owen's then going to come up in a Bigfoot outfit uh, and roast humanity from Bigfoot's perspective, uh, which is so cool. Uh, then we have this guy, Dave Baker, who is absolutely awesome as well. All these people I'm going to connect with you if you haven't met him already, dude, for shows. This Dave Baker dude, um, right now on Tubi, if you guys go to that free ass app or whatever, there's a show called Encounters. It was on Amazon Prime for a while. And Dave Baker is actually on season one, the second, the last two episodes, rather. And so you can catch that guy and his crazy stories um, over there, but he is going to be out there with us as well. We're going to be doing some late night uh, uh, UFO stuff, some, again, hikes. I mean, hikes on hikes out there. Now, um, day three, we're going to be going to Tennessee because, again, we're doing this in three different states, Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, all from our central location. Uh, we're going to go kayaking out there for a little bit and then go to the OC River Upper Olympic Middle Hike. This is an awesome trail out there right on the OC River. Um, and then we're going to do dinner, of course, and then our speakers that evening is Chris Matthew, of course, for Forbidden Knowledge News, filmmaker. His film, Occult Louisiana, is up on Tubi as well, totally for free. Uh, so highly recommend that. I may or may not be in it. Hmm. Now, also, um, Alexander Petikoff. Have you ever heard of him? Yes. Have you met? I don't Have think we've met. Them? I don't think... I, okay, I, I, I yeah. figured. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, bro. Okay, same thing. Thing. I'm going to hook you again. I'm just going to give you my presenters list and connect y'all for shows. So Alexander, amazing. He's part of the Little Monsters crew. He had Bigfoot off the trail and it went nuts on YouTube. And he is just absolutely incredible. So he'll be there. And all these documentary filmmakers also be filming out there as well. So that's sort of documentary opportunities for them uh, to kind of be in that. So you guys could be in documentaries, um, you know, for just coming out here. So uh, the next day, day four, we are going to be doing a North Carolina ape uh Appalachia Trail hike, and that is going to be awesome. We're going to kind of get dropped off on one spot, hike, have lunch, continue to hike, get picked up later, kind of like a river rafted, but on a trail instead, right? Uh, that evening as well, we have Les Durant, man. Um, he films crazy shit over Mineral Bluff, Georgia, which is sort of what kicked this whole thing off, honestly. I had a, him on the show. He shared screen with us and showed us all sorts of cool shit, and it was absolutely amazing. So he's going to be there as well as uh, Preston Dennett. If you've ever heard of him, he is one of my favorite authors. He's written 32 books. Uh, I got to meet this dude in person. He signed three of them for me, and he's just a sweetheart and an awesome dude. Um, fantastic researcher. Uh, so he is absolutely going to be there. Um, then we have on uh, day five, we're going to head over to the Expedition Bigfoot Sasquatch Museum. Now, this is ran by a guy named Dave Bacara unbelievably cool guy. He's in his 60s now. He's been looking into the phenomena since the age of 12, and he has refused to take secondhand stories for well over a decade now. So uh, it has a DNA lab on site as well as the largest cast prints of any occult museum in the world or something like that. Uh, he's already looking forward to building a second one, but we are going to get to go hang out and see that. 
Then we have a jam day there at the ranch for everybody to just kind of kick it. And then Dave Zed from Generation Z and I will be hanging out. And then we're going to invite everybody or whoever wants uh, to come up and share their high strangeness experience. And then, uh, oh, I love my events coordinator. She's awesome. Look at this. Uh, late night, definitely not a sacrificial orgy party, but pretty close. <laughs> we have a good time. So, uh, and then of course we have, we have shuttles. Uh, she's great. Kristen Bolt, shout out. Uh, we have, uh, shuttles and everything, um, for this event. So all you need to really do is get out there and that's it. And we have a variety of ways. Okay. Is it sharing the sugar boo tabs now or still just the website? Still just the website. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I'm going to... Okay, let's check out the spot now. Let's peep the spot. So this is Sugar Boo Farms. This is... Dude, highly recommend, okay? 26-acre um, farm out there. Uh, we'll just kind of go through some of the farmhouse pictures here. And, um, yeah, it's this is the Chattahoochee National Forest behind us here and all around us, by the way. So... When you go out here, you have access to all of this. There are animals on site. The farmhouse itself is absolutely incredible. Everything is just decked out in an amazing full kitchen, like uh, industrial-sized kitchen and all that stuff. We also have camping, uh, semi-private available. So there's a bunch of options on how to participate in this. It's not, and we have trimmed the fat. Like there's no money being made off of this. No presenters are being paid. Like everybody is being so sweet about that. We have railed out the cost to allow everybody to come to this thing. Um, it's not free and it is exclusive, but it's the coolest thing you can do. Uh, and we'll talk about, because again, it, let's say other conferences, which there's no nothing wrong with, they will go out and you will have a booth set up where you they have a laminate on and you're not allowed to talk to them because they're gonna go out and present. Sometimes they present and bounce um, and then you need to buy their book to get in line and then you don't really see them together. So you couldn't say, ooh, I wonder what this person and this person and this person think about this one particular thing that happened to me or because it involves elements of all of their disciplines, right, or modalities. But either way, what I'm saying here is our conference is what's called an intimate conference. So we're all going to be together. Uh, some folks, presenters do need to float in and out, but they are going to be there way more hands-on, even with the limited time that only two of them have uh, with us than any other conference you've ever been at. Plus, again, it's all of us hanging out you know, how do you take your coffee? We're going to have exceptional coffee there. So what I also wanted to point out here is where we are going to be doing these two-hour presentations each night is this really cool little spot here with a projector. It's got a big screen there. And out night, uh, at night, out under these um, stars out here in absolute UAPs, we're also doing this right around new moon. So it's just going to be a little crescent there to get the darkest skies that we could possible in the time frame. And then this place just tears down, man. You've got an upper balcony of the fire pit here. This is this presentation area with a little pagoda in the back. And then you have a, a pool down in the bottom with hot tub and all that kind of stuff too. So the place is decked to chill. Um, and we just encourage everybody coming out, having a great time, getting amongst them as it were. You know, get out from behind your computers. This is the time. This is what we've been doing. Oh, another presentation area, if, uh, you know, the shit weather, whatever. So we're doing this. Um, you know, this is the time with all this stuff, guys. So we're getting amongst them. We're creating a safe place for ideas to grow. And that's the whole point. In, you know, um, is, is a safe place for your ideas to grow. So if you've been looking for something like this, then, I mean, this may speak to you. So again, as we're going through these pictures, just expandingrealitypodcast.com. Uh, and you can just go to d slash events if you just want to go straight there. But it's got all these cool ass little bungalows, you know, out there. It's got 15 little huts. Some of them have bunk beds. So again, there's some semi-private situations available. Um, and the other cool thing about it, it's surrounded by a creek. So the uh, owner of the property said, if you get lost out there on the 26 acres, which could happen, absolutely, then you just hit water and it'll take you back to the house, which is a really cool navigational tool. This donkey is totally legit. We met him. <laughs> He's sweet. Yeah, so it's a it's a really cool environment, um, and it'll be May, so not a lot will be in season in the garden, but whatever we have, we have access to, and that's the spot, man. It looks so. Wicked. This is that's it. That's uh, what we're doing. It's the befriending Bigfoot event. It's gonna be so fucking cool, and that's only a little bit of what's going on. There are other musicians and people dropping by. Uh, Josh Cutchin, are you familiar with him? Yeah. Yeah, so he's going to swing by as well and have some books there to give out, uh, awesome. which is really cool. He's just going to come by and hang out. He's not even on the presenters list. He's just going to come through. Uh, and again, open invite for you, brother, if you guys want to make a road trip down. So that's when it's happening. It's um, May 15th through the 20th. Um, could not 
be more grateful for you letting me tell everybody about that and would love to see you all out there. And we would love to be down, but uh, I know we talked a little bit and the listeners know that me and my wife are pretty much going to be here for a while. Uh, but no, it sounds like an amazing event. Five days all out there. Uh, it's kind of, I'm trying to think it up here in Ohio, we have something called country concert. I don't know. It's like an outdoor music festival. It's like four days long. So it kind of it seems like a mix of a normal, con- not a normal conference, a conference and that kind of vibe, which I completely dig. That sounds so awesome. And super outside, man. You know, I'm a nature guy. Um, we went to the contact at the Canyon and presented up there um, in Utah with the Grimerica guys last April. And it was amazing, man. That kind of environment of just get out, hike, go do cool shit, then come back in the evening and, you know, be with each other, you know, in a really amazing space where no one's getting judged for some alien encounter they had or something like that. You know, it's like we all grow where we're planted, right? And we were probably not around each other. You know, there's probably not a lot of people in your immediate vicinity that are like you. Let's say in your family, for instance, I'm pretty sure you're listening to this, you're probably what's referred to as the sheep or whatever, the black sheep, right? But um, that's an interesting position you find yourself in because, you know, if you want to continue the metaphor, then what you were fertilized with was the shit around you, right? The traumatic childhood that you had, you know, any kind of uh, challenges that you had being authentic in your individuality, anything like that. Well, that fertilized you into a beautiful, tall flower. And all those little things can only grow so high because that's as high as they can view. But you grew into this beautiful, huge, like one of those big ass sunflowers, man. And now we can all see each other. And so now it's time we uproot and plant our gardens together. So it's one of these things to where we've been forged in this fire of this upbringing, of this place, man, of this encouragement of an unauthentic unauthentic existence. And it's challenging, man. So you guys made it, by the way. So congratulations. But that's the next step forward with this. And I know you all be doing things like this. We'll bring one to your front door, man. You don't have to come see us. We'll come do one right, right, at, right there at the house with you. And um, this is the way forward, though. We're doing our best to get out there and get amongst them. You know, because we can say a lot, we can talk a lot, but God, to get out in the woods with Trey Hudson and to hike around with these people, Alexander Petikoff, the most skilled, like you'll learn more about outdoor hiking and nature just with these dudes in a, you know, two hour hike than you would on any reality show about anything else. You know, you might not see a Bigfoot, but my God, you're going to learn and have such a cool experience out there, right? Regardless. So, and that's the whole point, right? We're not going on Bigfoot hunts because we're not hunting shit we're just going to go befriend bigfoot man you know but we're not also going to sit around sing kumbaya and that it's not that either it's just a really cool space man where we can just really discuss the ideas and and be free you know and thank the fact that we all grew where we were planted and that now we don't have to stay there it it sounds absolutely amazing and i think it's going to be a great success because it's just i love the sound of it i wish we could go this year maybe next year we'll get down there i'm looking at you emily Plant seeds soon, you know, and again, we'll bring one up to you, you know, where you guys are. We'll make it as easy as possible on you. We'll set something up through the ERE, dude, and we'll do a combined event at that. I'd love that. That'd be awesome. awesome. Ohio's a a really big footy state. One of my kind of stuff you're talking about, uh, we went to one of B's events, B B Mills. She's been Bigfooter of, I think the, is she the only female Bigfooter of the year ever? Yeah, I think she's the only female Bigfooter of the year ever. Uh, but B's an authentic, amazing, real, uh, loving person. And we were at an event that got rained out in cold weather. So it was just us uh, and, and a couple other Bigfoot researchers. And that was it. And we got to do a Bigfoot hike that night with just those guys. And we didn't experience anything. And Emily had Bigfoot's howling back at the tent because she stayed back. So it's her only experience she's ever had is when... All these Bigfoot people are three miles away, sitting out in the woods at 4 a.m. And she's like, I f- you guys were howling all night. And we're like, no, we weren't. <laughs> and banging on the windows. <laughs> what? Well, she's in a tent. <laughs> but no, yeah, it sounds, it sounds oh, absolutely God. amazing. Yeah. And she wasn't scared or nothing because she thought it was us. It's fast. The same thing. Oh, that's even creepier almost, right? How did she feel about that knowing... Thinking, knowing, discovering it was at you after y'all came back. How'd you, how'd you feel once you figured out it wasn't us? We gotta talk. It's a podcast. She didn't care. She does. She has no care. She, we have all kinds of. Okay. Are there any Unaffected. animals that really scare you? No. No. She's. We're we're crazy people. Okay. 
just another Tuesday. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. But yeah, that's awesome. And everybody at home, I'll have all the links below for everything. And this sounds like something that maybe you want more information. I'll have all Brandon's contact stuff. If you want to go, it sounds amazing. We'd be going if we weren't hospital bound for the month of May. So we'd be there, you know, if it wasn't for that, which like you said, there'll be more. We'll get you on the next one. I'm sure. Cause it sounds like a real cool thing. There'll be more. And we're not presupposing that a miracle will not exist in your case. In fact, uh, why don't we just go ahead and fast forward that and go ahead and amplify that for you. Oh, we're already extremely blessed. Uh, we're at where we need to be. And, uh, there's some great people taking care of us, but it's just, uh, for, just for precautions at this point, you know, just, so we're happy. We're, we're in a good spot. Good. I, uh, here's one for you. Beautiful. Oh, Reaper, what's up? Well, let's see a picture of yours, man. What you got? What you got going? It's just, you know, group myself. I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Reaper is a beautiful man. I'll tell you that much. Or I don't know. I'm sure of it. Uh, Connor, I don't think any of the J clones are going. But I have uh, one thing you said earlier stuck out, and I wanted to talk to you about the contact phenomena or the abduction phenomena. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Man, it's so God. How long is this show? Um, okay, and again, man, I'm I'm sort of uh, I've got a lot to say about things. So thank you for asking. I do speak in paragraphs, and I appreciate you listening. Um, so the contact phenomena. It started, of course, uh, with me coast to coast, pretty nuts and bolts, pretty Billy Meyer, you know, um, uh, the J Rod stuff with Dan Burrish and um, the that kind of stuff. I was always fascinated by his, like ancient history, like Mu and Atlantis and Tiamat and Stitchin Stitchin stuff with the Anunnaki and things like this. You know, this sort of idea of meddling, right? It's always been very interesting. Um, I've then, you know, and then, so you run the gamut, right? So from nuts and bolts, uh, it's coming, meaning, uh, uh, meaning that it's built somewhere else and then traversed here through s space, uh, in the construct that we're familiar with, meaning we live on a ball rotating around a sun in that heliocentric model, all that, um, in that way. So there's one possibility, but from there, really it, it goes to two possibilities, but then it's like cellular mitosis, dude, it, it, it quadruples and doubles from there about the potentialities of what's going on with this damn thing. It, it falls in the category of the phenomena, which is fascinating. And as Jacques Vallée says, is, you know, uh, consistently inconsistent, which makes it, which I'll come back to. So let's say that we go from nuts and bolts to you get a guy again, like Dr. Michael P. Masters on. He's an anthropologist, man. This dude's a tenured professor, Butte, Montana, fascinating dude says, you know what aliens are? I know what they are as an anthrop anthropologist. They are future humans coming back in time machines. I'm like, holy shit, you know, this This now just opens it up to a whole new thing. You're like, what the fuck? And really these sort of expansions happened in really massive increments where it just reframed the concept completely. And then you're sitting here after that and you say, well, maybe none of it's true whatsoever. And you say, you know, maybe it's all government craft, right? Or you say that there's no such thing as extraterrestrials because they're all from here, from inner earth. You know, you get the Alex Coyier, the uh, inner Earth, Agartha, that kind of stuff going on. And I love all that. Like, all of it I love, you know, so don't get me wrong. This is also why I can't have, like, uh, a belief. It's like picking a favorite ice cream or something like that. Like, I'm just, I love all of them, dude. I, I want to play in all these tents. So if I were to say Hollow Moon is a thing, then that presupposes all sorts of things, right? And so if if you leave it sort of open to, to have fun with it, then you get to come to these sort of things. So now it could be, again, all military craft. They could be from here. Another fucking awesome one was a guy named um, Ryan Musgrave Evans. And I don't think he's doing interviews right now, but amazing guy. Wrote a book, Crypto Terrestrials. Shout him out for damn sure on um, Amazon. This dude uh, is contact, he's, uh, contacted by something um, quite a bit, man. And, and so much so that he's joined us for a few lives and he was on the show a couple times. Every time I saw that guy, I made the joke that, hey, it's nice that they left, you know, they wouldn't abduct you for 20 minutes so you could come do a show with us, right? Because he gets contacted that much. He has like the creepiest story. I'm not even gonna ruin it. Go go listen to Ryan Musgraves Evans episode on my show and you'll you'll know what I'm talking about because of my reaction. But he has the most fascinating stories. I'm not gonna put words in his mouth. But his thing is is that he thinks he's being contacted by he's being told he's being contacted by an entity, yes, from a past civilization in time, but from a timeline over. So they're actually past us but over to where it was more advanced at a quicker rate. 
So they come to our timeline, which is in the future for them, but we're less advanced. Fuck it, right? So then from there, they have more of a supernatural uh, technological adaptation, meaning that they have uh, suits that will camouflage, but it's a technology. It's not supernatural per se. Like, um, you know, as like that old saying, um, Arthur C. Clarke's what any advanced technology would be imperceivable for magic, right? So, I mean, who's to say? Um, that's a fascinating theory. And then you can go into the interdimensional stuff, which um, really, if you go interdimensional, then it's all of those things. Because uh, time travel, once you get interdimensional, is just you hop out of time in this dimension. You watch it flow like a stream or a river, hop back in, time travel. So you can do the, those kind of things if you have that malleability. Then you get to shit like, I mean, brain in a vat, man. Then you get to real meta, meta reality stuff, right? So this also depends on sort of your worldview. Now, if you are a, we're a ball hurling through space, UFOs and aliens look a certain way, you know, because then that dynamic must conform to those conditions. Um, but then also, if it's not that in your world, or you have options to be flexible with that, then you could say, maybe if it was a flat Earth, okay, and if it was in, rather than a dome, it was an infinite plane type of a thing to where, yes, you do hit an ice wall, but on the other side of that ice wall, you keep going, there's a shitload of land, and there's this map they dug out of a Tibetan cave in, in the 50s in Japan, you can look this up. And it's our realm, like the Asimov map, which is also the UN map and all this stuff. And um, they have all these extra continents on the outside of it, which that's where the fascinating thing is. Now, if you then apply aliens or what people are reporting they're being contacted with in that frame of reference, then one would say that extraterrestrial would just be extra land just over there. Now, then, of course, they would all be in the story that they come from the stars or from somewhere else because they don't want you to know that just a thousand miles over there with technology you can use right now you could go get that and you don't have to live the way you're living or be you know uh, subject to these lizard turds or whatever so it's an interesting idea um again uh inner earth stuff usos are fascinating something underwater the fact that space is out underwater anyway is fascinating again now to this flatter earth or these adaptations of what our reality this physical place really is simulated universe of course they're just um effects or augmentation of the game, you know, to just sort of spice things up or just implant algorithms to just sort of see the way the trajectory changes. Any way you want to frame it, there's something. Another more darker um, option that I've recently added to the list is all of it's just the same. When we, Because I'll say that whenever you look at it through the lens of the phenomena, you start looking at stories like what Josh points out in his books and many, um, Stories of the, the phenomenon like Bigfoot and UFOs hanging out together or Dogman and uh, Bigfoot hanging out together in, in the case of Scott Pace on Chris Matthews' documentary, Colt, Louisiana, on Tubi Down. Shout out. Go check that out, guys. It's fascinating. Totally free. So um, those kind of accounts, kind of researchers that are really focused in a discipline like nuts and bolts craft, it can only be this, will you know, disregard or come up with really interesting reasons why they don't talk about cases that include such phenomena that contradict that or that have a little bit of absence of consistency, which that's the thing, right? I mean, you're being, con you're the, the thing change shape all the time. What are they just manufacturing new ones all the time off the lot? You know, like Sports they've got a Tesla engineer up there like just that. cranking out. Yeah, right. I mean, and so then you get to things that maybe it's a psychosemantic phenomena, man. Jacques Vallée, you know, talks about this. Heineck at the end of his life, forming Sufos got to this idea. Terrence McKenna, same thing. Maybe you just fucking make it up. You know, maybe it's all in your mind. Um, and that's a fascinating one. The other one would be that uh, all of it's microscopic and in you already. So really, whenever you do perceive it, you're perceiving it through the inverse black, black holes that are your eyes, that are your small black holes, your weak black holes. And it dovetails with the sigil of Lucifer, which if you ever look at it, the umbrum of your eyes, how your eyes look at the world and the sigil of Lucifer, the exact same pattern, the overlay, there's the same template. And what this would mean then is that your reality is created by the internal you that is then projected outward through this toroidal experience that will then reciprocate that, whatever you think is there, and that's dictated by your reticular activating system, which you curate. So in a way, again, maybe you're making all this shit up. And it, another thing to this, and then I'll ask you what you think, because I know I'm just slamming all these here, um, would be that uh, because it is such a subjective phenomena, that it is something that's um, hijacking your consciousness in a way. Now, let's say... The options for that to be would be that it's so terrifying, whatever it is, that your mind automatically replaces it as something else. Let's say an owl, like yeah, in the case yeah. of these screen memory cases, right? And your mind just goes, no, we can't do that. We can't see this. It's too, it's too big. Whoop. And so maybe that's what it is. 
is or it can project its consciousness whatever it is into your mind and then change the way you physically see it which is not hard to do you know your government does this shit all the time it's called perception management so within that uh, you can look at this in many different ways man there's an endless rabbit hole to what the phenomena could be but in the simplest terms maybe it's just all archons uh, what carlos castaneda called the mud shadows you know this thing that just sort of flues up to anything it's so subjective three people be standing there a ufo comes down two see it one doesn't what's that about or the two that see it describe it completely differently so it appears different to them near-death experiences mirror this as well three people die in a car all three die all three come back same scenario different characters different scenarios different realms so what's going on there you know it's almost like everything to do with this place is so up to you and how you interpret it it's so customized for you but we're all just sort of lying to each other saying that we're all kind of experiencing the same place you know it's just fascinating dude but again when you start looking at the phenomena it just sorts to maybe it's the whole it's all one thing or demonic you can't rule that shit out i guess you know if this is a soul trap reincarnation archon ran demiurge world like the cathars and gnostics believe then the archons are responsible for all of it and it's meant to subjugate you and take your louche right demons are always on the table but no it's uh you got it. You can't rule it out. No, yeah. Can't yeah. rule it out. Especially demons in the government are kind of the same thing. Uh, mm. It's a, it's synonymous. It's like a, what do they call it? Alliteration, right? It's like yeah. saying assless chaps. Like you don't need to say the assless <laughs> part. We know government lizard turds. We got it. Yeah. No, it's and I'm I'm there with you. I I personally and I, Jay kind of shares this opinion. I think for the most part, is that this is a, it's an umbrella, right? It's I think there's many different things happening that are kind of getting lumped under one thing. I think there are probably nuts and bolts UFOs, and there probably are government UFOs. And we got and one of the things we kind of blew up for was the organic UFOs, the animals of the upper atmosphere that are being mistaken for craft. Uh, I was just talking about this the other day. I've, I haven't talked about it in like five years. The other day I'm talking about this. Two days ago, dude. That's fascinating that you bring this up. Well, we're that's the thing that blew us up. Like, we have so many episodes on it, and we've done so much research into it that, I love it. I love it. And I think it's probably 5% of UFO sightings are actual animals from the upper atmosphere. Uh, yeah. And I think there's you, the whole Fae. I think Fae are in there, too. I think that some of this stuff is... Like, if you look at a lot of the, the abductions and stuff like that, they meet... The board, oh, episodes on it. Yeah, don't worry, Brandon. I, I We have more organic UFO episodes coming out. There's only, like, 20 so far. Uh well, you're going to please come do one on my show. Uh, he'll have one on expanding reality pretty soon. That'd be that great. Sounds good to uh, me. But it's this thing where I, I do, I'm with you. That I think that it's, I don't think it's one thing. I don't think you can point at the UFO phenomena as a whole and be like, it's just this. And, I, and with Bigfoot, it's, I, I think it's the same thing. You can't point at the Bigfoot phenomena and be like, they're all flesh and blood. They're all fae. They're all aliens. Uh, with my Bigfoot encounter, I had, it was very much a flesh and blood animal, in my opinion, without, it was, you know, had flesh and blood once in fears, you know, it was scared of a gun that my dad had pointed it, you know, up into the air, uh, but it was stealing food, you know, these are flesh and blood things, but we've had so many people on the show that have had these, uh, the, the you know, this, the, the paranormal Sasquatch, where they've had, you know, the glowing red eyes that walk off a cliff, and keep walking like a cartoon style, and they've had. And I believe these people. So, what does that leave you? You know, are they the same phenomena, or is it just two big hairy things that just happen to exist that we've experienced? Uh, the big thing we've talked about is the Fae will put on a face, and I'm using the Fae as a generalized term. I know a lot of our listeners already know that. That there's uh, African Fae, there's North American Fae, there's European Fae. Asian Fae and Australian Fae. They all have their own words for them, but they all kind of fit the same folklore and the same quote-unquote rules or behaviors. And so it's like dragons, right? All cultures have a dragon. All cultures have a Fae. And it's these trickster things, these, you know, but they'll put on the face that they, they think you want them to have. So if you're going out in the woods, you're out in the middle of Wayne National Forest, and you're like thinking about Bigfoot, and they're like, okay, they want to. They want me to look like this. I put on that face. They still run away. Got to take a drink. This is the archons and the jinn and things like this. This is what's so fascinating, also about our interpretation or ability to interpret reality. And what's 
kind of really going on here? Is it, are you the director or are you the actor? Or are you both, but you need to know when to turn it on, when to turn it off, right? And there's just, again, these fascinating ideas about like what you are, what the phenomena is. So to what you just said there, let's, let's dive into that one because that one's fun. Uh, I call this theory my panda suit theory. So are you familiar with, uh, like, well, you've seen the videos probably. Whenever people uh, go in to take care of little pandas yeah, and zoos and stuff, they put a panda suit on so that they blend in. Okay. So what I think could be a fun theory is, is that let's say that this is a mimicking entity or that an entity possesses mimicry, right, which is found all over in nature. The cuttlefish, there are uh, moths that have the eyes of the predator of the predator that would eat them on their backs so to keep those things away. So all these fascinating adaptations, their ability to survive in nature. Now, let's say one of those is, of course, to blend in, right? Camouflage is one of your greatest assets if invisibility is not available, right? Or uh, if it's just better to interact as you need to with physical objects, blend in, right? Go local. So if you're going native, let's say, and you're an interdimensional species that comes here, maybe you look at a Rolodex of Earth. Maybe it's updated, maybe it's not. And you see this creature that you want to turn into, and you've got a list of them. You're like, all right, dragon, all right, uh, dinosaur, uh uh-huh. Little marmot, okay, butterfly. Uh, ooh, shit, this big hairy thing. He's got two arms, two legs. Yeah, bipedal, that sort of fits our architecture anyway. Let's change into that thing. And maybe you step out of a portal, but it's the wrong time. Yes, Bigfoots were around everywhere, or they are, but they're very hidden and esoteric, but you didn't get the memo. And so you show up in a panda suit thinking that you're going to blend into nature, but all of a sudden, holy shit, uh, it's not, you're not supposed to be here. And then maybe this is what a lot of things are. Maybe everything's indigenous to this area. Maybe nothing lives and exists outside of this physically, but the realm goes through cycles in time to show, you know, in a simulation way or whatever. And again, if you want to look at uh, Jason Burmese, um Phoenix cycle or anything like this, where you get resets, I know Howdy Mikowski talks a lot about this as well. When you get resets in this realm, right, to where global flood or something the hopi talk about this right that they were saved by the ant people and took taken underground and emerged out of a sip of poo or a hole in the ground in the grand canyon and all these destructions of this place where you can see high technology and this is where you get into the tataria concept the maybe that we're in a post-tribulation rapture place like jesus has already come done his thing for a thousand years and satan's been the one sort of turning the keys around here lately which i don't know how many people would argue with that but when you look at it from these contexts then there can be you know manipulatability here but even so maybe again it's a psychosemantic thing but also it's mimicking a real animal so then it's a chicken egg thing you know is it deceiving you based on that or are the creatures inherently deceiving so you know maybe it's to pit you against like a pan type of an entity you know i'm thinking more gin trickster archon but they do they do it in any way. So this is like the the fascinating point too is um, in the soul trap idea, uh, not a fan of it, but it's uh, part of a conversation, I suppose, uh, is that you go, when you die, uh, you're greeted with a bunch of entities. Now, some people say, oh, I saw my grandma and she guided me into the light. Well, that's sort of the idea in this theory goes, not that I believe in it, uh, is, is that there's a trap set for you to where all these entities on the other side, right before, right after you die, rather, are looking to get you into the soul trap to get you flushed back down here on earth wipe your memory and continue being a little food source um in that case archons in that realm for the reference of the conversation can be anything they can be jesus krishna buddha your dog your grandma anything so the joke goes you got to throw chop grandma when you get up there to make sure you don't get sucked back down here uh all of these things are considerable and which again is more fascinating we don't get closer to the truth we get more answers it doesn't give us more clarity it gives us more confusion which is I mean, I'm having fun with it. Like, I'm not bummed out about it. It's not like, I think the bummed out part would be if you get to the end of your rope or you get to an answer that everybody can agree on. Consensus reality kicks in. It's certain. You're like, okay, well, all right. You know, you, uh, I, it may take the wind out of the sails a little bit. So I think there is something tugging on humanity uh, to to push us forward. But again, it can be anything. And it shows up as whatever humanity needs it to as a collective, but also on an independent level. You think of like the Fatima, the miracle of the sun in 1917, when those kids took convinced 75,000 people that they were being visited by Mother Mary, an apparition of Mary. And she would show up at this time. They showed up an hour late. It was raining all day. But when the thing showed up, it parted the cloud, 75,000 people allegedly dried off from this thing, dancing around the sun, moving in the sky. So what is that? You know, it's like it gives you these huge scale things and then these 
intrapersonal, really microcosmic boost to your intellect. It says, hey, follow this, you know, but it's always accompanied by redirects. It's always huge. You hit um, near-death experience. Um, the poor bastard who saw the uh, Stephenville UFO in 2008, like quit his job, got divorced, like grown ass man, you know, retired, like everything about this. And so it changes you. It it's responsible for so much in our lives. So that's what's so fascinating about it as well. We're so curious about, about it because it changes us so much, but be, it changes us because we're curious about it. It's it's fascinating, man. I think it's awesome. Yeah, and with that, like you said, almost the cloaking nature of some of these things, I think there that's a yeah. big part of it, whether it's, like you said, is it them putting that forward or is it us putting that on them? And I think there's a mix of that. Like we talked about shadow people which are their own kind of super weird phenomena connected to all these other things to where uh, I had an encounter and it, you know, it was the black herd black and I fully believe that's not really what they look like. It's just our brain trying to scream at us. Hey, there is something here that could be dangerous. Here's a, here's where it is, you know, deal with it. And I think that's why they're void. There's, you know, they're this naked. It's not like it's black. It's void of light. It's void of stuff. And it's, just your the primitive part of your brain screaming out at you, hey, deal with this. And like you talked about earlier with, you know, these these screen memories, you know, it's easy to do with humans because we have that as a part of our trauma, you know, protection inside of our brain. Our, our brain will rewrite over stuff to keep us from thinking about it to prevent trauma. So if you already have that built in, it's easy to manipulate. Yes, your brain actually will do this in real time. This is where we get to RAS, your reticular activating system. Are you familiar with this or have you heard of it? Go ahead. So it's a bundle of neurons in your mind, uh, in your brain, rather. Uh, it functions four different uh, functions of your body, but, you know, like melatonin and things. The ones I'm most interested in is the one how it governs your perception, right? Perception is everything. It's everything. And the way the scientific definition for the way that your reticular activating system governs your perception is, is that it raises up or boosts useful information as to push down or remove useless information. Yeah. Now, what's so fascinating about that scientific definition is that there are two subjective words in there, useful and useless. Mm -hmm. Who determines that, right? So the tip of your nose, by the way, is always visible to you, <laughs> perpetually visible. But your RAS, your reticular activating system, finds it useless, so it filters it out of your awareness. Now, everybody, now that I've said this, can kind of glance around and you could see the tip of your nose. and you'll, It'll be in your awareness because we just talked about it, right? But what other things are like the tip of your nose? that maybe you, maybe your brain inherently, maybe the realm inherently, decides is useless information for you and filters out automatically because it runs through your prefrontal cortex. Your, your, everything goes through your vision. You think about it, process it first, and then you are shown. It's not, you're not given a real-time image. You interpret, then see, right? So, and that is governed by your reticular acti activating system. So if your RAS tells you that you live in a world where demons and angels running around all over the place. If you see something fantastic or mixed with the right vibration of energy to be something extra, your mind, your reticular activating system may just go ahead and fill in that blank for you. Some people don't think any of this shit's cool and aren't ready to see it and it's not on their path and for whatever reason, their RAS will absolutely filter that shit out completely. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take, take this up to the scale of sheeple, okay? If you look at Leonardo da Vinci's quote, there are three classes of people. Those who can see, those who can see when shown, and those who don't see. And the last one, don't see, is very important. They just fucking don't, man. This is why Paul Revering is silly. This is why, can't you see? This is the way it is. This is the way. No, they can't because they don't see. Your reticular activating system has blinded them to anything. And your beliefs have a lot to do with this. You know, your beliefs will hold you to a firm grip of reality. Another fun way to play with this is if you've ever shot for a car. Uh, you will say, I want a blue Tesla, right? And then all of a sudden, blue Teslas appear all over in your reality. Well, did you create them all over the place or were they always there? You just now noticed it because now your brain is wired to see them. It's a fascinating exercise, man. So, and when you really start to think about what you think about and how it works, you'll change. This place changes right in front of your eyes. So we, we talk about this on the show all the time. Have you ever heard of the duck experiment? It's the same thing you're dealing with. The duck experiment? Yeah, the bird, the duck. No. Okay. Yeah, no, please. All right, so we talk about the show because it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. When you drive on the highway, there's all these ponds, and they're full of ducks and geese. 
And when you look over, they're all mallards, which are the green-headed ducks, and they're all Canadian geese. But they're really not. It's your, like you said, it's your brain painting or getting rid of the useless, quote unquote, useless information and painting them all one color because you don't need extra information. When you stop and look a second time, you realize there's, there's over dozens of species of ducks in there and there may not even be a single mallard. They, you know, it may be all the blue heads and white heads and buffalo head, you know, all these crazy colors. And you would have swore two seconds ago, everything in there was a mallard with a green head or a Canadian goose. And there might not be a single one. So it's the same exact thing you're talking about. It's just what our brain does. And this is why eyewitness cases in court testimonies are the least reliable. You cannot count on someone to stand there and report back what they saw accurately. Yeah. There's always an emotional component to it. And then, always. And then, so it filters it out through its perception or its paradigm, its ability to see based on its experience. Yeah, exactly. And, and beliefs. And we, uh, another thing is with eyewitness testimony, with especially the paranormal and cryptids and stuff like that, I've dealt with it. So I was a biologist. I've dealt with it with uh, snakes and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, what we view as dangerous animals, uh, they get inflated very easily. I can't tell you how many mist- snakes I've removed that were supposed to be 12 foot long and, you know, spit and fire when we got there. And they're about, you know, a foot and a half long. And it's a gardener snake that's under somebody's shoe. And it was, but before you got there, it was a six foot long rattlesnake that was, you know, fired up. Yes. Uh, and it's just something when we don't understand. Like, with five heads that spit fire. Absolutely. Uh, they did it with, uh, I think it was, it was, I don't know if it was Coleman or Gordon did this with the Mothman. With the loop, you know, at the TNT plant, he put up a bunch of varying sizes of Mothman and had the eyewitnesses drive, you know, drive through and, he was driving them, and they'd write down the size. Mothman 1 was 4 foot tall. And Mothman 1 was, you know, 9 foot tall. And I think it was, like, 88% inaccurate. None of them got, like, 88% was wrong. You know, every once in a while, they'd get one right. And I think it was right at the, oh. it was the bigger sizes they would get right, because they were pretty much all were seeing them as 8 foot tall. And now scale that to criticism, okay? Scale that to all the people who comment that they don't like something you're talking about or comment that you need to something or that whatever, right? Scale that up. It's how people are seeing their reality. So this is where you're empowered by the four agreements, right? Don Miguel Ruiz wrote this amazing book called The Four Agreements. Very very easy read, like 115 pages. Um, And one of the agreements is don't take things personally. What's beautiful about that is you can't take things personally one way or the other in a good way or a bad way. If you're over complimented, it'll go to your ego, inflate, whatever. But also it's got nothing to do with you, which is what's so fascinating about this. So if it's got nothing to do with you, then you're taking it personally, then that's you, right? So there's nothing about an interaction with someone. Usually if you're doing the other three three uh, agreements, not making assumptions, being impeccable with your word, always doing your best, then you can abandon the idea of taking things personally. It's a fascinating exercise again, because you see this and a lot of folks will take on a lot of people's shit, man. And this is what beliefs are too. You'll believe something about yourself because it's some, something some weird dude said 20 years ago, some shit. And it's just like, what, why is that still in there? Like curate those thoughts. Think about that because it's, it's curating your reality. You know, that, that stuff's in there like a thorn for a reason. Just sort of take a look at it. See if that's still the way you feel about it and move on, you know, and you just decide and your reality literally changes in front of you. The Dr. Dwayne Dwyer quote, right? Uh, that when you change the things you look at, the things you look at change. And it's fascinatingly accurate and not in a freaky woo-woo way. Like you don't have to say, well, I don't talk to Archangel Michael and shit. Neither do I. And I'm really not into that shit. Um, but what I will say is that there's a very real effect that you can have on your reality. And it starts with you figuring out how you see the world. That's it. I love it. And yeah, it really is. I seen my Sherry, she posted something. Do you know? You. Yeah. Okay, do you know about? Sorry, this is a completely different subject. Bob the fungus. Bring it. I do not, but I love it. I love uh, fungi. So we've done a lot of episodes on. You know, fungus have actually passed some intelligence tests. They can count. They can store food. Uh, they, yeah. That was one that I left out of the aliens. It could be a sentient entity here that takes over the consciousness. Yeah. So that's what we we've, we've covered that they are actually uh, some of the orbs and stuff we're seeing and some of the UFOs we're seeing. Are actually their them expanding their consciousness into the three the third dimension essentially. Uh, that's why they. You've, oh, that's so cool. You've seen fairy rings, right? Yeah. Do you know what that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, because I'm thinking about now, yeah, the mycelium networks, how they grow in the fair, in the rings Release like that. And it looks how like interesting to think collider. that... So it's like an energy focusing point. So they could... And they're what associated makes me... with portals. Or not portals, they're associated with orbs. So, yeah. Well, it makes sense. Maybe it came out of that. Maybe that fairy ring is what formed the orb to yep. blow out like a bubble almost. Exactly. You know? Because so we've around. got a friend of ours. Yes. And exa I mean, maybe for anything. God, what a fascinating theory, dude. I love that. I Because now it makes me think about other highly sentient beings like, yeah, highly sentient, like dolphins. Maybe that's what other UFOs are, right? Is like. Those, dolphin apparitions let's expanding the their consciousness talk out. for a minute because I, I gotta tell you about <laughs> another time because yeah i did i was on one-on-one -on -one and we talked three and a half hours about whales oh shit okay yeah so uh it'll happen yeah well uh but bob so bob is uh he's an old fella out in washington oregon i can never remember i always get it wrong uh he is the single largest living organism on the planet and some people think it's Pando, the trees. It's not. It, Bob's way, way bigger and heavier. Uh, he is, if you squared him up, he's 2,200 acres. But, you know, he's a mushroom, so he's not squared. He's an entire state forest. He's integrated into almost every plant and most insect life on his back. And he's been proven to systematically, basically he'll kill sections of forest to re-promote grassland growth to re-nutrify the soil like a big clock. And we threw, you know, we found this. How he was discovered in the 40s is they did a core sample. They cut off a root or a mycelia network, the hyphae. They cut the section of that off, and 100 acres of trees died the next day because they couldn't exist without Bob. So we used to think Holy these shit. networks were more uh, open trade between fungus and plants. Now we know it's much more controlling. The fungus actually hijack. They get their hyphae into the, the tap roots of trees and plants, and they actually run the show. But they do it for the benefit of everybody. 95% of plants on Earth could not exist without fungus at some point in their life cycle. Most plants today on the planet Earth need fungus for germination so that they actually start the next generation. Others like some of the tree species and stuff. So Bob's an entire state forest. He's got two uh, little sisters that are nearby. They're not nearly as big as him. But Bob, we think he's around 50,000 years old. We're not quite sure. It's hard to age. But he's a honey mushroom. So here's the weird thing is there are many other honey mushrooms. He's a pink honey mushroom. They're normally, you know, the size of a football above ground and probably 10 or 15 feet squared below ground. And Bob, it just happens to be an entire national forest. Oh, and they, they, they are, he's, can transport data incredibly fast. We just did um, Man-Made Horrors Beyond Our Comprehension as an episode. And they just started integrating uh, fungus, hyphae, and mycelia networks into computer chips because they can transfer data faster than anything electronic. So we're actually making well, what they do with the Japanese subway system. Yeah, they redesigned it based off of a slime mold, which is a type of fungus. Yeah, because uh, they're just more yeah. efficient. You know, it's and we think uh, we have a whole episode about we think the fae are actually fungus with the way that they're. It's just their Dude. consciousness that you're interacting with. Well. Because this is how it would scale, right? Because you take the human out of the centerpiece of it and say that, yes, other things around here do have the ability to project, cast, operate differently than maybe science with a dollar sign has told you that it does. And that's all around us, right? When you start looking at things, and that's what our kind of shows do, man. It's critical thinking. That's what we're talking about here. It's not just batting things off you know, real quick. It's looking at the data, considering it, and that's fascinating. But I have talked about mushrooms because i was a psychonaut for well over 20 years man been very familiar with the psychedelic part of of that realm and mushrooms have been fascinating to me and this is one of those things that you say yeah maybe it was an entity bro oh man panspermia bro it came down on a comet dude and started here and it you know everybody that enjoys mushrooms on a either spiritual or recreational level you get connection with it and you just happen to you know want to make sure that the forest and shit's taken better care of right and that you want to tell your friend how how great the trip was and how wonderful of an experience you had and how there's no come down and that it's way better than anything else, right? So it's got a good PR um, element to it just based on its ability to affect you and what it can do for you. And I mean, then you look at like the sacred mushroom and the cross and this dude did decipher the Dead Sea Scrolls and said that, you know, Jesus is actually a mushroom and that uh, the rain coming down is God's jizz and growing his son, the mushroom. And that's what we're connecting with God with. Um, 
John Allegro is his book, uh, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Um, but fascinating, you know, any, either way you look at it, it's, it's an awesome, it's an awesome insight into this because then again, it, it changes the game a little bit, especially with the food, food of the gods, uh, Ter Terrence McKenna's book. And it talks about this explosion in human consciousness, like 250,000 years ago. I don't know about that kind of history timeline, but either way, it's a fascinating thing to think that monkeys were just walking around. If you follow that narrative and then they picked up a mushroom and then just all of a sudden, you know, started seeing in colors and we're. Their vision was amazing, and they could now connect and write and draw and, you know, take their poop and do more than just throw it, you know, stuff like that. Like, they were getting creative with stuff, and that was all due to, allegedly, their connection to this mushroom, which in, it changes your consciousness. So, if, if nothing else, it's definitely that. So it's definitely that. We have lab proof that it rewrites neural pathways, and I, I'm okay yeah. with it. It really does. Uh, I've never done anything like that. I worked with the federal government for a while and stuff like that. So there's nothing I did. It does, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I think it has amazing properties, and I think people that do, you know, I think it can have amazing health benefits and everything like that. Now I drink chaga coffee every morning and stuff like that because uh, nice. there's a lot of, it, I think most cures are found in mushrooms. It's because they're the last common ancestor between plants and animals are fungus. And fungus are much more closely related to animals than they are plants. Uh, I'm sure you know, but for people at home, like, beef liver mushrooms chicken of the woods hen of the woods these are all mushrooms that taste and feel like animal meat kind of probably because they kind of are meat they're not a plant i can't tell you how many times i know a lot of our listeners have the same thing where somebody's like oh you know mushrooms a plant it's not you know it's the sexual body of a fungus you know which is much more an animal they move like they're they're mycelial networks in the hyphae underground. They crawl through the ground. They're not stationary like a plant. They are actively moving, seeking out food. Uh, Doctor P. Money of Miami University was the one that figured out they could count and they can interspecies communicate. Where that is an amazing thing. And I'll give you this if you want the synopsis real quick. Or the synopsis real quick, as it's a full episode in itself. But please, where basically these these types of fungus. So he built a box that was like Eden for fungus. There was about 13 species in this first box of different funguses. And then he turned it up to 100 degrees and had almost no moisture and pretty much everything died besides a couple fungus individually. So he, trans uh, he transported those into a new box that had hundreds of species of fungus, thousands of individuals that have only ever experienced paradise since they germinated. And when they cranked up the heat on that one, so the first box had like a 98% death rate. The second box, after he cranked the heat again, had a 98% survival rate. And it shows that these two mushrooms that survived the original apocalypse figured out how to do it, how to ra ration water, how to you know, ration food. And when they got to the new place, they told everybody how to do it. You know, and we're talking, not, these are species that are you know, extremely distantly related. The group of fungus is absolutely massive. Like you mentioned earlier, slime molds and you know, your amamita mushroom are very different. But there's, we have proof in some level they can connect, and we have figured out they can count. And you've, I'm sure you've seen it, but have you seen where they plug the synthesizers into mushrooms and they yes. talk? Yes, yes. So do you know that's originally made for reading brain waves, so right? So cool. So you're reading... Yeah, an EEG. Yeah, yeah, you're reading their version of brain waves. They don't have electrical impulses like we do. They have something different. They don't have nerve endings. They have hyphae. But it's their versions of these systems. Uh, but yeah, the, the fungus stuff is completely fascinating. We've done probably 10 or 12 hours on just that and they can count and, uh, yeah. And then whales, you mentioned whales. I absolutely love whales. Dude. We humpbacks. Well, and then think of the Jonah and the whale story. Mm -hmm. Oh, you cut out. My apologies. Go ahead. No, sorry. I'm just, I'm bad. Oh, but, uh, Jonah and the whale. <laughs> No, you're okay. So the Jonah and the whale thing is interesting because some people interpret that as to be a UFO, right? That mm. Jonah was picked up by a UFO and that's what the whale is because that's how he survived in it for three days. Some say it's an initiation thing because the three days thing is always real big. It initiates. Uh, and so to that then, maybe, yeah, that's what inspired then maybe UFOs to drive around. Maybe the whales are the ones that have been abducting all, all of us and kind of taking us back in the form of these weird, squiddy looking people that they think are what humans look like, you know, from their perspective. And who knows, man, um, maybe it could be manifesting those types of things. Because also, dear mycelial, talk about the mushrooms that were transferred, maybe also the 98% that didn't survive, sent a signal to the others via some sort of quantum entanglement, right? What Einstein called that spooky action at a distance, where they are connected 
by something that time doesn't, you know, distance, it doesn't matter. There's sort of a hive mind concept to that, yeah. which then lends itself to creator, architect, simulation, something like that, right? It's fascinating. Yeah, and with, with the fungus aspect, they are, when people, you know, you, you probably have this experience, I don't know, where people talk about meeting these entities in a, on a mushroom trip, and, they, you know, the mechanical mm -hmm. elves or that kind of stuff's been described a lot. Uh, and my whole thought is that fungus, they are much, they're like halfway between a computer and us with how they think. You know, they're very much math as much as what we'd call personality. So when you would meet them, you would have a, almost like a cyborg, right? You know, this, this very robotic. Uh, so we, we connected them with puckwudgies. So a lot of puckwudgie jokes, they get called trickster spirits. And trickster entities from all around the planet kind of have the same deal to where they're not necessarily evil, but a lot of their jokes can end with your bodily harm or death. And that may be because to a fungus, that's not that big a deal. So during these drought situations, they'll cut off whole sections of their body to survive. It's not even a thought. You know, it's like, okay, I need to lose 33% of my mass if I'm going to survive this drought. And they'll just cut it off and let it die. So you losing an arm in a joke isn't that big a deal to them. And that could be where some of this misconnection with the Fae and that, like, time dilations with them and all this stuff, they're experiencing, they don't, they don't quite realize that we experience the world differently than they do. It's the same thing when we put humanistic traits on other things. You know, we don't yeah. realize that other things are experiencing reality differently than we are but Absolutely. we are the ones reviewing them so we put our stuff onto them dude this makes me think now that the hybridization program is mushrooms attempting to become bipedal in a physical way well they already have it's almost right? like that movie the arrival right well, well the they arrival, have right? because they've well they have in the way that they've hi they hijacked the consciousness of the Occupant. So in a way, they're parasitic in nature. Oh, if you want to be real technical about it, right? Hijack animals and walk around with them. They actually will actually wrap around their central nerve systems and puppeteer yeah. them. Yeah. Well, they already have that. Yes. Uh, you know, and that's like The Last it, of Us is based off of. It does that. Yeah. And and if you look at something like The Arrival, where nature then starts to mimic the human form, you know what I mean? And then it turns from this animals like. Is that annihilation? Did you ever see the arrival? Um, maybe annihilation. Yeah, is that where they? Yes, that's where they the go into the misty the thing. Eggs. Apologies, you're right. The egg thing, and she got yep. the language. Yep, the squiddy people. The squiddy okay, people. annihilation. When she? Yes. When the trees are mimicking humans, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going on there? The trees evolving into that. Now I want to plug a book real quick that I'm almost done reading. It's uh, the Secret History of the World. A guy named Jonathan Black. There's a few people that have written Secret Histories of the World, and he points that out in here. But um, this book is absolutely fascinating. Now, one of the things they talk about in here to what you're saying is, is that humanity's consciousness is actually transferred into a few different versions. He interprets that some people interpret the Bibles and origin stories of religions to be actually our transition from plant consciousness to animal consciousness, being that the tree in the Garden of Eden was actually us in plant consciousness that was transferring into or evolving into animal through the snake so the snake was inviting us to come out of the garden into a physical body in this way the mushrooms then would see this as an opportunity right to be bipedal and to simply shift forms as far as consciousness goes if you're a mycelial network you got no problem regenerating all the time then maybe an experience different to that would be a more finite one right where you kind of commit to one thing die out but again there's a conscious element to this in this also, he talks about art changing over time. People's ability to see and interpret what a tree looks like changed over time. We couldn't see it from the perspective we have now because we were it. So just like figuring out the game within the game, it's impossible. So you had to see yourself from something else to evolve into something else. This is also replete in other stories like Moses taking the stick, which is made of a tree, dropping it in front of the Pharaoh. Of course, it changes into a snake, right? Again, it's these ritual initiatic sort of plays on this but this is where our art changes our consciousness changes this is where you start to see these horrible historic figures that show up some enlighten some actually demolish and tear so it's this balanced progression of human consciousness but it actually evolves from something very different than what we were so again like you're saying those creatures meaning early human or early conscious whatever we are now was very different so like the story of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai was mistranslated. His radiant face was actually first translated as horns. So he had a horn face. Michelangelo even had a famous sculpture that he did of Moses 
with horns. Now that was a mistranslation based on radiance, right? But another translation based off of that would be that Vedics and Hindus have always been able to see these energy centers in us, these chakras, right? And so in that case, that radiance would have been what the people saw of Moses. They saw his chakras, but they didn't see those on a normal basis. So it was different for them. So they were scared is the interpretation. So vision was different. We saw color different. Like we didn't get blues was, until Egypt, shit that. like this. The, yeah. yeah. So yeah. There's like and all of it actually reflects in the heavens. So as we discover new planetary bodies for the route as we discovered neptune for instance i think we got introspection as we went to uranus we got global uh consideration or something like that so you get these bigger um upgrades in consciousness as we discover further celestial bodies and then now it's funny because allegedly they're discovering shit all the time right so now it's just an open season on what we're able to look at out there and then determine therefore elevate our conscious too it's fascinating dude really when you go into it and you made me think i don't know like I said, I'm, we're famous for tangents over here. Bro, bring it. Have you ever looked into plant consciousness or sentience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you know this. So cool. You ever drove through the mountains and when you look up and you see uh, it looks like steam, right? Right after it rains, it looks like steam's coming off of one spot on the mountain. Do you know what that is? No. So that is one tree. It's normally a really old tree that his offspring or her offspring are starting to drown from the rain. So what they do is they suck up all the water and they off gas it through their leaves as an emergency tactic. So they're communicating Shut with only their children, no their way. Direct children. And this is proven and we've talked about it on the show and you can look it up. Ron Cass is one of the researchers that discovered that and they are purposely saving their children. So if you go to the forest when these big old, we call them forest kings, these giant old trees, they'll have three or four of their direct offspring around their base that are kind of stunted. And the whole plan is to when these forest kings die, they're going to dump, they're actually, their root systems are interconnected with their kids. They're going to dump all of their nutrients and resources so their kids can take their spot in the canopy. They so, can inherit their resources. Yes. So it's like, you know, they, they save stuff for their kids. If their kids are struggling during droughts or during times of famine and stuff like that for these plants, they'll actually pump nutrients to them to save them, to keep them alive. So when you think, when, and I'm, I, ruin, I like to ruin life for the vegans, I guess, that you there's no such thing as a non-sentient thing on the planet, in my opinion. Everything's experiencing life right. in its own way. And it may not be, it may be very alien, quote unquote alien to us to be a tree. But now we have uh, proof that they can sense their surroundings. They mostly speak through chemical, you know, responses and stuff like that. But they have language. They have their version of a language. It's not like us, you know, it's very different. But uh, like a computer would be ones and zeros and we have all this verbal and, you know, physical cues. But plants are experiencing the universe and are doing stuff with that data. They're not just passive beings that are existing. Sorry, I was reading. But yeah, no, so the trees care for their kids. There you go. And you hear about this communication through the root systems, but my God, that's fascinating. I think it's also fascinating that trees, you can make uh, what's called like a giving tree, you know, where you can take the cambium layers and match them up mm -hmm. to like citruses. And they did this with stone fruit where they had 15 different kinds of stone fruits growing on this or nuts or something. Yeah, growing on this one mm -hmm. tree root, right? The system. Because if you match those layers up, it's just information and nutrients at that point, and that branch holds what information it's going to turn into based on whatever nutrients it gets. See, it's fascinating, do, man. We do it with potatoes and tomatoes. You can cross stem those guys, and you can get potatoes. And we do the same thing them. like that with potatoes no, and. We do it in our garden. You can cross stem them because they're both oh, nightshades. Shit. They're both in the nightshade family, so they're both very closely related. Got you. Yeah. So anything. Right. So you can grow potatoes and Like you can do citrus like this. You can, yeah, you can grow yeah lemons and limes, no problem. Uh, grow your margarita tree. We were in Florida. Yeah, we were in Florida. And I think it was apples, oranges, and limes are all in the same tree from, from clips and, you know, them putting them in and them growing. Grafts, you know, grafting on trees. Uh, we had a lady in our town that did it with rose bushes as yeah. well, where she'd have whole sections of rose bushes would be one color because, it's you know, that's what it's trimmed from and grafted back onto. 
Uh, but they're incredibly wow. resilient. It's crazy. Now, we're at an hour and a half, and I, I can already tell me and you could probably talk. Oh, bro, and, days. You know, so you cut it off when you, whenever. Well, I wanted to give You shut it the, down whenever. Uh, I'm going to give everybody in the chat, here's your chance to start asking questions as I burp under the mic. Disgusting. But, yeah, if you guys have questions. That's the signal. That's how you know. It's time. Normally, I'm, I'm drinking during these things. Where I'm at, I'm not allowed to drink, so. Mm, got you. Got you. Normally, I'm a lot louder, too. But there's there's babies and people in rooms next to me, so that's probably not the smartest thing. Keeping it chill tonight. Yeah. You're being uh, conscientious. It's very sweet. But, yeah, guys, if you've got questions for Brandon or about anything from the conference to his show to anything we've talked about, and I know we've scratched just the surface, and I know we're going to have many more talks, I can already tell. Uh, but they just... That should be released this year. So humpback whales have the most developed language, at least that we've mapped, of any other species on the planet. Um, then that's where I think we're up to over 12,000 characters, which is essentially words in their language that we've mapped. Uh, but they have a device that they can actually talk to humpback whales with now. And I was just watching a video earlier this week about it with the researchers that are working on it, where you can basically type in something and have a conversation with some of these humpback whales. Uh, but humpbacks are about, they're more human than human. They, uh, here's, uh, here's a little burps crack me up, how frog man summons, he's chill to speak and act as well. Yeah. So, I don't know, here's your dark thing. I used to do prof like talks for schools and stuff like that. And one of mine was about commercial whaling. Is probably one of the worst things we're doing to nature. Because it's probably the most sentient animal on the planet besides us uh, with how they deal. So do you know what commercial whalers' favorite target is? Uh, no. A mom with a fresh calf. Because when they uh. get the mom, the calf's not going anywhere. Yeah. So you get two whales right there. What they'll do, though... So there's spots, there's ways to kill a whale very effectively. So if you watch, you know, people like in Iceland and stuff, they still hunt whales out of like 15 foot wooden boats. And how they do it is that there's two main arteries that run near the base of the tail that if you get those, they'll bleed out very quickly. It's, you know, if you're going to kill one, it's the most humane way. What these whalers will do is they'll aim for the back, like what you'd call the shoulder area. Uh, there's nothing there, nothing vital. It's just blubber and meat. And they'll harpoon them there. So these whales will be stuck, and they'll start putting out distress calls. And what we found out is other species of whale will answer those distress calls and try to come help the mother and calf. Not the same species, the other species. Humpback whales are the, probably the most notable for this. They'll come in, in in hordes to try to fight off whatever's hurting another whale, uh, a baleen whale. And so commercial whalers, are taking, you know, they take advantage of that. But to that point... I've, I just shared one of these videos recently on the Facebook page. Have you ever seen a couple of these divers and stuff? Sorry, I could talk about whales forever. Like I said. Dude, I'm fascinated by it. So there's yeah. been two, so a couple things that have happened with humpback whales and divers. If you're going to dive with a whale, it's probably the best one to dive with because they're very conscious of you. Uh, sperm whales are very scary to, di to dive with, even though they can be really conscious of you because a sperm whale can accidentally liquefy your organs with their big sonic booms they use. If you're in front of that, re that big head, is a resonating chamber for a sound. So when they boom, they can actually, if you're close enough, they can, your brain can become scrambled because it's just reverberating inside your head. They, they're really God, what a way about, to go, though, right? They're really good about not doing Could you it. Imagine? They're really good about being careful. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, but I think it did happen with one guy where he had internal bleeding from it, a diver. Uh, so, anyway. God. This, this group of divers were out. It was two ladies. Uh, they were in about 80 foot of water, crystal clear, uh, free diving. And out of nowhere, this big, so bull humpbacks are, are solitary. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't hang out with everybody else. The females are the females and calves hang out with everybody. So they were swimming with this big bull humpback, which is really rare. They don't, they're not as sociable. You know, they just kind of hang out by themselves. And as they're diving, this gargantuan animal, you know, talk to them, something 65, 70 feet long and you know, 50 tons, starts pushing him. Uh, he's doing weird movements with his body. And he starts t putting these two girls on his nose 
And he starts leading them back to their boat. And he starts pushing them up and pushing them up and pushing them up on their boat. Finally, he had to get out and leave because this animal the size of a semi-truck won't let him be in the water. They didn't know about it until they got home and they reviewed the footage. A 14-foot tiger shark was stalking them the whole time. And this whale was purposely putting his body in between the girls and the tiger shark. So what? What now that may not sound as crazy as it is. So keep in mind, from this whale's existence... From the second he was born, a tiger shark has never been a predator to him. It has never been a threat, even from day one. You know, humpbacks really only have orcas as predators ever in their entire life cycle. So he realized that these girls were in trouble from a different animal that he had never identified as a predator to himself. So that's abstract thinking right there. That's out-of-the-box thinking that he went through, and he made the conscious decision to put himself in between the girls and the shark, and when the shark wouldn't leave, he made the shark, he made the girls leave. So that's right, incredible levels of thinking. Well, you can say also that actually they're preyed on some orcas sometimes, but man, man. And so what's even more remarkable to that story is he saw predators in danger from another predator that he was not in threat from. But he also wasn't in threat from that predator, but he made that distinction. How did he know that whenever he yeah. pushed him up on the boat, there wasn't like somebody there with a stick of dynamite ready to blow his head off or harpoon him like he's seen happen to, you know, all of his ancestry. And, you know, like the mycelial network, they probably carry that in their genetics. You know, there are things about the human culture that uh, famines will occur and then generations after all of their ancestors will carry a little extra weight because of it. And it's that genetic memory. And so whales have this about humans as well as whale, but they also <laughs> chose, you know, to do something really cool. It's, it's like you um, saving a, I guess, a, a copperhead or something from a hawk. You know what I mean? It's like the hawk's no real threat to you, but the copperhead can absolutely kill you, and, but you still choose to intervene and remove it. Exactly. That's interesting. Another really cool one, and I'll read these questions if we got some in, is in, I believe it was 1999, a whale biologist, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He was diving with another bull, humpback whale. So humpback whale pods are led by matriarchs, which are the, generally the oldest female in the pod. Uh, males, once they hit kind of what we call their teenage years, they kind of get pushed off because they're big enough that really the only thing's going to bug them is people and, and orcas. So there's not a whole lot else they're going to do, but they get a lot bigger than the females. So this guy was free diving. So when two opposing pods meet so pods now we know they have individual names they have family names and they have pod names but when two different pods meet the matriarchs of both pod will go vertical in the water and they'll interlock their fins like almost like a handshake or a dance and it's you know a greeting and stuff like that and they'll, they can mix and then you'll watch these these all these big group of whales swimming together and then they'll all break off in their original pods you know it's it's very interesting so this guy was, I believe it was 1999, he was diving with another bull humpback whale, a lone male, and they're just swimming along. This thing's letting him get really close and touch him and stuff like that. So the guy jokingly, he, this man, a human, goes vertical and he extends his arm out. This massive animal looks at him, goes vertical, and gently extends its flipper and touches the guy. So not only did that whale recognize that the guy was trying to do a greeting, he did it so carefully not to hurt the guy. And whales can be clumsy and stuff like that. Whales have killed people swimming with them. I don't want to make it seem like they have it, but they're huge. You know, it's like, you know, it's hard to be around something that big, and even when they're being careful. Uh, But, yeah, so these animals have recognized sentientship in other animals, us, you know, and they treat it as such, and we don't do that. You know, we're still eating them. Well, we are not. You and I are not. Humans as a whole. Uh, yes. We are one species. All right. Let's get you some questions. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I like that. Uh, okay, right. here you go. Born not to run. Do you think Bigfoot will sol- or be solved in our lifetime? Bigfoot being uh, super popular now, it feels like if we don't, we might never find out. Well, Brandon, what do you think? Uh, I think that anything's possible, first of all. And to find out, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what I am. I'm trying to figure out what this place is. I'm trying to figure out what, what we are. Um, 
So I think based on your perspective is the only way you're going to get answers. I don't think that ubiquity or just some sort of certainty without agreement exists here. And so in this, though, just a very buckshot answer, I would say that no, uh, simply because, I mean, just to the example that the more you look at any phenomena, the wider it grows, you know, the bigger it goes and the deeper and more mysterious and even the outlining cases you have to consider at a, at a level so as to not push everything out because it's part of the story, right? Even if it was an alien mimicking Bigfoot, why did the alien mimic Bigfoot or why did it find it a good idea to put on that panda suit, whatever? So I don't know. I don't figure out is a tricky one, too, because, yes, that's. Ultimately, what shows like this and what we're talking about is, is figuring it out. But it's in bite-sized pieces. I think we figure out a little bit, just like of us, right? We figure out a little bit, and then we learn a little bit more and grow and give it time. And maybe some of those things we expand on, but it's so fractal, right? So the deeper you get into something, the more it expands out. I hope that answered your question. So no, I don't, I don't honestly think we're going to figure anything out I in this consciousness. I think in our I don't think that's time, what it's about. we may only proof or whatever i've seen a bigfoot i know they're out there it's you know that's like you said that's my proof i don't need anything i personally don't need anything else i think if i think flesh and blood bigfoot may be proven in our lifetimes but i don't think that's the whole story like you were saying you know i think that's a small fraction of what people are experiencing when they say bigfoot you know it's just because you hit one with a semi and you know you get this dead probably primitive human or manatee you know, I believe Bigfoot's a manatee. That's something I say a lot. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> You're fascinating, dude. That is so interesting. Oh my! Uh, a buddy of mine, actually, Asher, he wrote me one time and said that he thought that, well, one consideration for Bigfoot would be that it's operating 100% from the right hemisphere of its brain. Now, think about that. An animal that can choose, you know, selectively. And so with us, of course, if we're hemispheric at all, we're really logical, we're really left brain. You know, we look at the world in very nuts and bolts. We've been programmed that way. So if nothing else, so you either look at it that way or you're trying not to. So that's one of your two options, I think. But with Bigfoot, maybe it doesn't see its world that way, which is why it can disappear, which is why it can blend in like that, which is why it can just maybe apprehend your consciousness or the way that you see or the way it presents itself in its environment. Like it's not a limitation for it in the same way that it's limiting for us or that we find it to be baffling. Maybe it's just what it does, you know, no big deal. You just made me think of. Have you ever looked into like split brain disease and theory and stuff like that? Where people would, will only choose one or the other? Well, it's like, uh, so there's theories that there's either, there's actually two or, or operate th out of one or the other. That there's actually two or three people inside of our brains as a normal human. And that's how we got through the early nights uh, as in human existence. But there's one of them is extremely violent and primal predator. And serial killers, they think that they may be, that that's the guy that got in the driver's seat. Normally, that's the guy in the back right. for special moments. And they think that they, Survival. Be, you know, that's the guy in the driver's seat for serial killers. Still super methodical. They're predators, right? We talk about some of these serial right. killers. They are not just people that kill. They are, you know, they're very methodical with their methods. They're very, it takes a long time for a lot of them to get caught. And it's normally when they are ready to get caught. You know, it's when they start, you know, they're on X kill. So they start getting sloppy on purpose. Uh, I don't know. It's, right. it's interesting stuff. But yeah, so Born Not to Run said, most people say yes and not give a lot of thought. So glad someone's being realistic. Yeah. And I, I really only think it would be the the physical Bigfoot that would get proven in our lifetime if that. Uh, I worked with endangered species. But even then, where is it coming from? How is it breeding? You know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, is it an inner earth or a subterranean type creature? Is that what you think? It's probably an underground type thing? Uh, the flesh and blood. And the underground's not what we think? No, I I could, I don't, I personally don't subscribe to Flat Earth. I can believe in Hollow Earth as in, like, there are massive, like, the I just went and watched the new Godzilla movie, which is great. But there are these oh, massive yeah. pockets inside the Earth, and the Earth may not be exactly shaped like we say, like, what science says it's shaped. But I worked with endangered species and stuff like that. I professionally went out and looked for animals that the government said did not exist in areas that they said there's no possible way and we found them, right next to human society, like in yeah. the city sometimes, that nobody was seeing these animals. So now I make it halfway. I've told this story on the podcast, but I'll tell you. I have a friend that's a big cat researcher. She tagged a cat. She trained it and tagged it, like put a radio collar on it. Never found the cat again. She'd get 30 or 40 feet from the cat. Never seen it. Never found it till the radio collar died. Months and months. So... 
Now let's say Bigfoot's uh, the the flesh and blood Bigfoot. Let's say it's halfway between a human and a big cat. You're not going to find him. I don't care what anybody says. The body thing, we did it. We we talked about the this county in Alaska has the most grizzly bears on the planet per capita. It's like thirty or forty thousand grizzly bears in this county. Uh, the main researcher has been there for thirty five years for grizzly bears. He's only ever found two bodies of grizzly bears, and one he watched die from another grizzly bear. So, Damn. and the other one I think had a radio collar on it. Now that uh, that was years ago, we did that episode. So I think each, you know, one time he watched one die is the only reason he found that body. So big animals can disappear in these natural environments very fast without having to be buried and stuff like that. Uh, there's elk time lapses, like you watch videos of it, where a whole elk carcass in the Pacific Northwest will be gone in like six days. It'll be unrecognizable in three. Where you find a leg bone. How many people have picked up a Bigfoot leg bone and been like, look, I found a moose or an elk or, you know, something you can't tell, even unless it's a skull, you really don't know, even unless you're a professional at, you know, something, ID animals like that. A rib is just a rib. You know, it doesn't look like anything special unless, like I said, a skull is very prominent and that's about the only thing that's super prominent. Finger bones and stuff like that. Uh, so that, a flesh and blood Bigfoot hiding in modern day society doesn't surprise me. Uh, like I said, when I first was going to school for that kind of stuff, I, you know, I had seen a Bigfoot and I still don't want to believe in Bigfoot. After doing all this work with endangered species and stuff like that, it's like, they could be right here. You'd never know. There's deer, there's whole hidden populations of deer inside cities that people see every once in a while and you never know they're there. Foxes and coyotes that live in town that you never see. To make it a little smarter. I mean, how many t- people, like people that disappear into the forest and like, uh, I don't know if you watch the show McDodge. Or he's just this guy has been, no. been out there for like 30, 40 years. He was a mechanic in Vietnam. He got back, and he's just living out in the woods in California. And the only reason you find him is because he lets you find him. He let a film crew follow him one year. It's a really cool thing. But, yeah. Anybody it's else? amazing. I got any questions? I don't. We could talk forever. It is. It's So the, that's the flesh and blood. I, like I said, I don't believe Bigfoot's just flesh and blood. I think there is a category of Bigfoot that is an animal. That when you shoot it, it would die if you shot it with enough stuff. Uh, but I also, you know, we have people on the show that have talked about shooting Bigfoot, you know, 30 feet away, and they just look at you. You know, they're not, they're not there, kind of. You know, there's something else to them, where it's not just an, a thing. And same with Dogman and all that stuff. You know, it's, there's that extra dimension. I believe a lot in the extra dimensional stuff, the interdimensional stuff. You know, these guys sure. are... When then- so go ahead. Yeah, and Bigfoot or Dogman could naturally have access to natural portals around here as if it's just science, right? Mm-hmm. As if it's just earth science. It's like, yeah, yeah, the portal between because those two trees and I can tell the water underground because of this crystal in my head that, you know, is unique to my physiology or my pineal glands tuned a certain way or whatever, right? So we have animals that break the laws of physics everywhere. Everywhere. Dude, all so, the time. So my dog turns a bunch of circles so it shits north or south. <laughs> That's fascinating to me. Uh it's like, so Pistol Shrimp, you ever heard of those guys? Uh, yeah, and they'd shoot that sonic punch out. So that's Manus Shrimp. Pistol oh, Shrimp okay. have this big claw that they cock back, and it shoots a superheated jet of water, like 2,000 degrees, and it cooks their food alive. And they're these tiny, if you look at them, they look so weak. God, that's crazy. They look so weak and meek. And you're like, that thing can literally shoot something like the surface, the, the same temperature of the surface of the sun. Uh, so there's the laser-eyed uh, sky or sky gazer fish that we just figured this animal out. We don't really understand how it works. Where it's, you ever seen a star gazer? Uh, no. Is that the one that lays flat and its eyes are on the top of its head and it can kind of blend into the seafloor? Yes. It looks like a football. Like it's round, but it's like its face is on the top. Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple yes, species yes, of them. Yes. The uh, laser-eyed stargazer, we just figured out this past year what they're doing. Forever. We there's went, a cool name for a band, by the way. <laughs> they would stare at fish, and then the fish would die. And we couldn't figure it out. Like the old men that stare at goats. Yeah, well, yeah. They would, they, these fish would just stare at animals until they died. And we're like, what is happening? You know, people, there's, and it, so finally they figured it out. They have, and we don't really know how they're doing this, they have organs on the corner of their eyes, the same uh, organs that, like, electric eels have. But electric eels are fully insulated. Like, when an electric eel opens its mouth while it's shocking, it'll kill itself. Those big white pores are where the electricity comes out of. 
and you ever seen like electric eels, they, their eyes look really milky. That's an extra layer of protection yeah. on their eyes because they can elect, they can kill themselves with their electricity discharge. Thank you. So the stargazer doesn't have any of that, but it has these little organs in the corner of its eyes that shoots out directed beams of electricity that kills animals instantly. We don't know how, how do they do. They it. measure it. They uh, they got a basically imagine it's like a big piece of paper that can detect like a voltmeter or something. Kinda, it's like a big piece of paper that detects like discharges, and they could see it like like almost like making okay. a gun, essentially, electricity gun. It's insane. And it shoots on two focused beams, or is it combined to one, or how to? So I think they're know? still looking into it because this is you know okay. like I said very pun intended. Very nice. I like. I see what you did there. Very pun intended. Also, look at that. We could go with it. I love them. But yeah, no, nature breaks the laws of nature constantly. It's uh, one of the rules of nature. Constantly. Is when you make a rule, it will somebody will break it. And this is back to us for, you know, figuring out any of this shit. Like anything. We can't even figure out how fishes make lasers out of their eyes, let alone Bigfoot, man. Exactly. That's just wild. So you're talking about mantis shrimp. They punch so hard they create uh, an implosion underwater. So they had to rewrite. That, yeah. They had to rewrite some physics laws to make that make sense. Because of these motherfuckers. <laughs> they, they had to read. They had the to one quantum physics does this all the time. It breaks down physics. That's why most physicists hate it. Mm. They're like, oh, I don't know. I just make them ups. I don't know. They hate it even more when it's a shrimp doing it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something around them that they could have seen and just taken a minute and looked at. they like, ah. That's a bug. All right. There it is. Anybody else have any questions? Maybe the <laughs> so whales bug are underwater. Kill people. Uh, anybody else got any questions before we wrap up here? I love it. It's been, oh, I said, we're, it's been, a, we tried to wrap it up about an hour ago. We're still going strong. Are you drinking out of a, oh, this is wonderful. An artillery round? Yeah, copper, my wife. Uh, no, uh, it no, but like that's a good call. Uh, a, I know, that is a good point now that you say that, actually. Um, no, it's a copper water bottle. There, It uh, mineralizes your water and stuff. Don't cook in it's it. It's good. My wife got it for me. Mm -hmm. Don't cook in it. I will not. It's just for water. You'll get Mad Hatter's disease. That's it. From oh. cooking in copper? Yeah, so they used to, like, tomato soup and copper pots killed a whole bunch of people. It causes a chemical reaction. Ooh. It just stuff out of the copper. I can't remember what it is now. Uh, but, yeah, because Grandma... You can get uh, Go ahead. copper overdose, for sure. You it, can get copper overdose. It it's crazy. A, it makes something else. It makes it, it, it... The byproduct of the reaction is, like... I can't remember if it's mercury or magnesium. Is it because of the acidity of tomato? Yeah, stuff like that. High acidity foods. And like in England and stuff, they were cooking big batches of food right. and killing whole blocks of people. Who knows? They're probably doing it on purpose. Oh, that's convenient. All right. Yeah, they melted down all the bells from Tataria that were helping people to make cauldrons to kill people. Very nice. You'll have to come on and talk about Tataria. It's an interesting realm. Oh, it's. I, mean, I can get you people to come on and talk to, to about Tataria. Like uh, Matt... Terillion, have you had him on from The Great Deception? Or Matt Smith, another Matt. He spells it with two T's. Um, modern Old World, he's fascinating. He's also a yurt architect. Absolutely cool, dude. I love yurts. Um, oh, God. He's a yurt design on you on Instagram, rather. Go to Instagram, yurt designs. It's got the three, the, I want to say it's the Irish triangle cross with the swirls thing. I forget what it's called, but either way. Uh, that's his logo, and he's awesome. And Matt's just a really cool dude. Fascinating presentations and stuff, but also a damn yurt architect. And he makes, like, mansion yurts, too. They're, like, connected by these really cool walkways and garage yurts and all kinds of shit. It's really interesting. Do you think it's in Siberia? What? Tataria? Uh, I've seen... Yeah, when you look at the people who present stuff, like... um. My Lunch Break is another great channel. If you guys want to check him out on TikTok or YouTube, My Lunch My Lunch Break is, was the great deception, honestly, two of my favorites, uh, and then Modern Old World. But um, there are maps that show Tataria. It says Grand Tataria on there. And also Easter Island uh, is a tie-in to Tataria as well, because on old maps, that exact location, exact same shape of the map, was called Tartara, and it was linked to that culture. And then the moai that they have there that they put up are just silly ways that they did it but really they think that uh people went out in out there and dug all, all kinds of shit up and, and so there's treasure and shit all out there but all sorts of underground things going on as well but the tataria is fascinating just because again it lends itself to this idea that there was a like that 
we're actually an entropy. Like we're getting dumber as a species, not cooler and better and more enlightened or whatever. Or to say that we are with this seat of our consciousness to plunge as far deep as we can into that experience so that we can elevate out of it with new perspective. I could see it. I don't know. I've seen some pretty dumb stuff happening. <laughs> Welcome to Costco. I love you. We're avoiding that. We're not going there. We're not doing it. So, Brandon, could you please... Um, uh, we're, we're doing well with conversations like this, man. This is it. Everybody in the chat. Oh, it's been great. This is where it's at. Can you go back through and tell everybody where to find your stuff and all that for me, pretty please? Absolutely. And thank you again, dude. This is outstanding. Many more to look forward to. I'm pumped. Do this a lot uh, yes, so... God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, guys, thank you so much again for watching, listening here with us or in the future whenever you're catching this. Uh, you can catch us at expandingrealitypodcast.com. I conveniently put it in the little bar there on my screen. So that is also where you can find the publishing house. You can find all of our journals. We have seven in print now on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. All links are reflected there. And then you have the events as well, which we have our Befriending Bigfoot event coming up May 15th through the 20th. Come check it out. These glow in the dark, by the way, which is I really cool. It. So uh, come check it out, guys. But expandingrealitypodcast.com. You can check the show out. And Patreon, we're doing a bunch of cool stuff over there. Patreon, we host a ton of free shit, too. All the transcripts are hosted for free over there if you guys want that. Ad-free audio with sign up. And then we also do um, Hangouts, where we invite all of you. We have one this Saturday with Emily Trinkus, who I've had on the show. She's an amazing astrologer. And we're going to talk all things Eclipse live this Saturday at 3 p.m. So if you go sign up uh, before then, then I'll get you the link and you can come hang out with us. So yes, all that's going off, man. And um, just having a blast meeting cool folks like you getting to do cool things. And let's just keep going, you know, that sounds awesome. And I'll have all those links below for everybody. So don't worry. All right. So we end this. We have a tradition. Basically, okay. I'm going to count down from three and then we're going to yell bye and then the stream will end. Now, oh, okay. I love that. I normally yell really, really loud. I cannot do that because it's currently 10 p.m. in a building with mothers yeah. and babies. So I can't okay. quite scream. Have you ever seen the movie Pootie Tang? No. Okay. I highly recommend it if you haven't. But there's a song, there's a part in there where he gets to a song that he did, and it's just, and it's silent. But he, raise, he opens his mouth and like nothing comes out and it's the biggest hit ever and there's a joke to where this kid's listening to it it's silence and his dad comes in and tells him to turn it down anyway we could do one of those we could do just like a well you can you know a silent one you can and... scream i just can't <laughs> all right well i'm gonna be with you on this but i'm, I'm with you let's go right. let's do it three two one bye bye <laughs> guys thank you for listening to crib is the corn podcast remember the best way to support the show is share it with a friend but if you are craving more of the j clones and more from mr e there's always extra content on patreon and our paid member space on cryptids of the we'll catch you next time with more exciting fun and informative information bye, bye.